It's no secret that licensing your music is an extremely profitable way to monetize your songs. And there are four paths that you can take to successfully create this consistent income stream. But, you know, like any road that you choose to venture down, there are going to be pros and cons that come along with each path. So today, I want to break down the specifics of each one for you. Let's take a look. Welcome to this episode, and today I want to talk about how independent musicians can earn upwards of $100,000 a year or more. Now, that obviously sounds like a lofty goal. And as struggling musicians, you know, a lot of us just don't even believe at this point that that's possible. But the reality is that we see that all the time. We see independent musicians and we hear stories about them all the time who are absolutely killing it as independent musicians. And the reality is that if you're motivated enough and you're driven enough, you can absolutely earn $100,000 a year, you know, roughly, give or take, a, a little bit. And it's no secret that licensing your music is an extremely profitable way to monetize your songs. Not only is generating a recurring stream of back-end residual income really one of the most attractive aspects about sync licensing, but today you can write, you can produce, and you can license your music from the comfort of your own home studio. You don't even have to go to a professional studio anymore. Uh, you don't have to pay the high daily fees for the studio or for the engineer, the assistant engineer. So you can absolutely make a six-figure income with your songs. And in sync licensing, there are really four paths that musicians can take to successfully create this consistent income stream. However, it's important to keep in mind that like any road that you choose to venture down in life, there are going to be pros and cons that come along with each decision. So today, I want to break down the specifics of each of these four paths when it comes to sync licensing. The first path is direct to music supervisors. And this is the one that, you know, musicians are always talking about. Well, I'm just going to send my music out to music supervisors. Well, here's the deal with that. If you are extremely detailed with your metadata, if you understand the ins and outs of sync licenses and master licenses, if you're great at marketing, if you're great at negotiating, uh, if you're great at networking, if you're great at building personal relationships and understanding contracts, and, and really most importantly, if you're very prompt at responding to emails and phone calls, then administrating your music catalog on your own and getting your music directly into the hands of music supervisors is going to be a great path for you. But this path requires the most involvement on your end. Well, why is that? Well, because it's your responsibility to fully administer your catalog. And this means that you have to be able to uh, really drop what you're doing at a moment's notice in order to submit music for a specific request or to negotiate a sync license when your track has been chosen. Uh, and the reality is that the film and TV world works very quickly. So if you wait too long to respond to an email or a phone call from a music supervisor, then the opportunity is going to pass by you. And taking this even one step further, in order to successfully submit music directly to music supervisors, first you have to put yourself in their shoes. Just imagine for a moment that you're the one who is constantly being bombarded with music submissions from independent musicians, managers, independent publishers, uh, all throughout the world on a daily basis. What would the subject of that email have to say for you to even want to open it? What would the content of that email have to contain for you to continue reading past the first sentence or two? Okay, how would you want someone to approach you for you to even give their music a chance? Now, these are questions that you need to consider before you even start approaching others with your music. Okay, you're only going to get a few seconds of their time. So if you're emailing them, that email subject line alone, it needs to show them the value that you're bringing to the situation, all right, uh, or that you're presenting to them. Uh, it could be as simple as songs for, and then insert the TV show or the production that they're working on. 
uh, after that, all right? Um, but ultimately what you're doing is you're showing them that you can bring value to their job and ultimately to this interaction. Now, by letting them know that you have music that's relevant to the project or the projects that they're working on, you're bringing value to them. And again, you just have to put yourself in their shoes. Okay, if, if, if you're looking for youthful pop songs for a project, you wouldn't want someone blowing up your email with links to their heavy metal album, right? So always think of yourself as being a service to them, simply because you're supplying them with quality music that's relevant to the project that they're working on. Now, personally speaking, for years, I fully administered my own catalog this way, really with great success, and I learned an extraordinary amount about how to deliver music to supervisors in a way that would generate placements. However, as my catalog grew, I found that I was spending more and more time administering my songs rather than creating new ones. And eventually I just had to make that decision to hand the responsibility of managing my catalog over to someone else because I'm much happier in my studio writing music and, and playing guitar than sitting behind a computer spreadsheet and an inbox on my email provider. So it was vitally important for me to build relationships directly with those individuals who were licensing my music. And of course, I wanted to be on their first call list when they were looking for specific requests. But administering my growing catalog it ultimately turned into a full-time job, and I wasn't able to spend as much time creating. And this is what led me to sign my catalog with an exclusive licensing agency, also known as a music library. And that leads us to the second path, and that is exclusive music libraries. Now, these libraries generally require you to sign your songs with them for a specified term length that's stated in your contract. And the library may take all or just a percentage of the publishing for your songs, as well as a percentage of all licensing fees. And the most common deals are those where the library takes your publishing during the contract term and splits the upfront licensing fees 50-50 with you. However, of course, each contract is different, okay? Also, depending on which company you're working with, uh, these contracts can be fully negotiable. Now, many songwriters are initially hesitant to give up any rights to their songs because they put so much blood, sweat, and tears into them, you know, and they're so passionate about their songs that they're often afraid of losing, quote-unquote, ownership of their music. And, of course, this is, you know, completely understandable. But every songwriter needs to understand that once you've written a song, you will forever be entitled to the songwriting income from that song. Every song that's written is broken up into two halves. 50% of the song's income is always allocated to the songwriters, while the other 50% goes to the publisher. And the publisher is the administrator of the copyright, and that simply means that they're the entity that handles all of the administration, all the negotiation, all the contracts, etc., when it comes to generating income from the song. Now, of course, this is a business, right? It's important to remember the phrase that it takes money to make money. And, you know, obviously that, that couldn't be more true when it comes to music publishing. You have to give the publisher, or in this case, the exclusive library, a reason to even work and promote your music. And the reality here is that exclusive music libraries, they employ a uh, team of highly specialized individuals who have relationships with music supervisors, they have relationships with music editors, production companies, trailer houses, uh, different commercial uh, houses, etc. And, and they're constantly working the songs in their catalog. They're constantly submitting them for placement opportunities. They're negotiating the license fees. They're collecting those fees and then they're paying the songwriters their share. So from my own personal experience, I've had extraordinary success working with exclusive music libraries simply because their teams have been able to generate many, many, many more placements than what I was even able to do on my own. And I, I, I had fully administered my catalog for roughly six to seven years. And, you know, of course, one of the most exciting aspects of this path for me <laughs> uh, is being able to check my cue sheets every few days and, and seeing the new placements that have come in all while just hanging out in my studio and, and working on new songs and not having to worry about administrative tasks. So even with the benefits, of course, of working with an exclusive music library, there are still many, many, many musicians who are just not comfortable with the idea of giving up any type of publishing on their music. 
And so for those individuals signing with a non-exclusive music library, that would probably be the best option for them. Now these deals with non-exclusive libraries, they're commonly known as retitling deals. And what happens is these companies, they're, they're gonna take your song, they're gonna license it under a new title. This allows you to retain full ownership of your songs under the original titles. Keep in mind though, these non-exclusive music libraries, they are taking the publishing on the new title of the song. So for example, let's say you write a song called Blue Sky and you sign it non-exclusively to company A. Well, company A is gonna absorb your song into their catalog, but they're gonna retitle it Sunny Day. So when they pitch and place your song, it's gonna be under the title Sunny Day. Now, being that you still fully own all the rights to Blue Sky, remember this is the exact same song, just different titles now, you're, you're free to sign it to you know, another non-exclusive company. You could sign it to company B. And they may retitle it something like Sunday Drive. So now you have two companies pitching the same song, but under different titles, while you still own and control 100% of Blue Sky. Now, that sounds like a great way to monetize your song, right? Well, yeah. Through the mid-2000s, this was extremely popular until technology caught up. Here's the problem. Music recognition software can listen to a song and just by the waveform, they can decipher what it is, right? This is basically the same technology that apps like Shazam use, right? We're all familiar with that. But for this example, let's say that company B got a featured placement of that song on a popular TV show. Now, of course, they're entitled to the publishing royalties from the performance of that song when the show airs. But the music recognition algorithm recognized the song as Sunny Day. And company A, in that case, is paid instead. See what's happening here? The song Sunday Drive, company B licensed Sunday Drive, but the song was recognized as Sunny Day. So company A was paid instead. Now this will cause a huge problem for you down the road. And for this reason, non-exclusive libraries really are no longer looked favorably upon by those in the industry. As, as a whole, non-exclusive libraries are not gonna generate the, the consistent high income producing placements that are really necessary to bring about five-figure royalty statements every quarter, okay? You have a couple five-figure royalty statements every quarter, boom, you're at $100,000 a year, all right? And that leads us to royalty-free libraries. Now, the fourth path to monetizing your music really are royalty-free libraries, and these are often companies that supply music to low-budget projects, uh, such as, say, like wedding videographers, student filmmakers, um, you know, it's common for directors or producers to have a yearly or even like a monthly subscription to these libraries, to these different services. And that gives them access to all the tracks in these catalogs without having to pay a royalty. Now, what this means for independent musicians is that you will not receive back-end royalties for the use of your music. Now, I've been doing this for, uh, you know, coming up to 20 years now. I have yet to meet any songwriter or any composer who is doing exceedingly well writing for a royalty-free music library. In fact, I don't know anyone who's doing well with music in royalty-free libraries or non-exclusive libraries. On top of that, it's also always, no matter whether it's royalty-free libraries, non-exclusive, exclusive, whatever, it's always a good idea to listen to the tracks that are in each library's catalog, right? Because this is a really a great litmus test for the overall quality of the catalog and really the revenue that it's gonna provide you, all right? Also check out the, the library's credits that they have, their placements, all right? Are they getting placements on TV shows? Uh, who are their clients? Okay, just a, just a few minutes spent on their website researching this goes a long, long way. And if you're just starting out, if you're learning production, if you're building your catalog and you're gaining experience in the sync licensing world, a royalty-free library or a non-exclusive library, those might be the perfect fit for you. However, if you already have a catalog of quality music, you're really gonna wanna opt out and, and explore the exclusive music library route first. So all that to say, the question of course is, you know, can I really make $100,000 a year writing music? The answer is yes. It's absolutely 100% achievable. 
and you have to be out there hustling every night and playing smoky bars, selling your CDs and merch and you know, driving all hours of the night in a cramped van just to get to the next venue? Obviously, the answer to that is no. The way to generate $100,000 a year writing music consistently is through sync placements. And I have just my own philosophy on this. It is consistent placements equals consistent royalties. Consistent royalties will always equal consistent income. And as you have consistent income, you generate financial freedom. Now, the benefit, of course, of financial freedom, what does that give us? That gives us personal freedom and creative freedom. The reality is that licensing your music is not hard. You just have to be motivated enough to dive in and understand that the licensing business and the licensing path is completely different than the traditional music industry path that so many of us are already familiar with. When we learn how to navigate the sync world, that's when you are able to start generating consistent income. All right, if that's new to you, I encourage you to go download my ebook, The Four Step Plan to Licensing Success at mastermusiclicensing.com slash get started. I uh, hope today's episode was inspiring and informative for you, and uh, I will chat with you next time. <laughs>